Following Rachel in Prince, I'm thinking of queer placemaking as a process of imagining another way to be in space. I'm believing and imagining as a radical process that you do while you wait for a shift to happen. While you wait for a shift, you understand that when it comes, it might hurt equally and differently from what was there before. In an interview with Susie DeFord, Rachel says of her work that it, quote, considers spatial relationships as an ethical field. The spatial relationships in Rachel's writing turn to the fractal spaces of cities, the comfort of looking at a church across the street that you'll never enter, or the strangely public intimacy of seeing your neighbor through their windows, of hearing your neighbor having sex, or seeing them holding a baby or eating a meal. In her work, how the city feels and the spaces that compose it are concentric forms. That union of feeling the city and also moving through it is a queer attention, one attuned to queer bodies and also to urban spaces as queering our expectations of what we think they are. In recent months, it's been in Max Andrecki's work where I felt most guided to new ways of thinking about the queerness of how to model the places where the domestic meets the public. In Max's work, I follow him as he reads for queer experiences of space to demonstrate how the social systems of cities transform over time and how that social transformation in turn shapes the built environment. <clears throat> One of Max's recent projects focuses on queer social reproduction as a means of imagining an urban form of how the social conditions of one generation appear in the next and how queer bodies might remake the frame of all we could expect to see in those subsequent generations. Another of Max's project considers objects in the home as a way of marking queer time in the lives of transmasculine people. A third project applies the practices in feminist geography to the role of white voluntary sector groups in Kenya's transition to independence in 1963. Max and Rachel both model what queer bodies do in and to the city. Both of them invent new spatial forms in order to show those relationships. In his work on queering social reproduction, Max reads how the actions of queer people shape urban space. He describes queer labor as essential to the space of the gay neighborhood, as an organism digesting queer bodies into the fabric of the street, the neighborhood, the city, which, as an aside, is some of the most lyrical writing I've ever seen a geographer do. I think of Max and Rachel as each writing about and into the potentials of queer space. And in their work, I understand queer space to be not just where queer people go, the residences and storefronts and parking spaces they take up, but an alternate mode of thinking about the collisions and compressions that form and reform cities every day. I think of geographer Natalie Oswin's writing on queer space and her call to consider the quote, ways in which a queer approach can be deployed to understand much more than the lives of queers. I think of queer space as in David Harvey's terms to describe ways of thinking about the urban, a general theory of the city, and his assertion that any general theory of the city must somehow relate the social processes in the city to the spatial form which the city assumes. From reading Max and Rachel, I understand spatial form and social process to each show up differently, and thus to require a queer map or a queer, queer written form in order to be together and make sense. I read both Max and Rachel's writing as exercises in a queering of form. Their work suggests that figuring out what cities are and what they might be is a practice that requires formally innovative writing. I went to Naropa when I was in my 30s, mid-30s. I became a poet late. And I looked around and I thought, oh, people need coteries, so I'm going to go to get a coterie. <laughs> and, um, and it took a while <laughs> there, but then Carla Harriman showed up, and um, I found began to find a coterie, and um, wrote this. Yaya's Rapture, before and after Carla Harriman. You think that the sorry the things you think are funny, in a crowded room, books and flies, books fly one thing at a time, lined up dreams, diminishing orders, primary color codes first, then secondary, then brown, tertiary, pastels, fluorescents named after birds and Disney movies as far back. The city until Berlin, Khrushchev wants it now. In the West, feeding their addiction for metaphor, they watch as closely as they can. They believe, they make it religion, craving a national pastime to which they'll all know the tune. Humming as mediation, familial, fat, 
flat-chested androgen Amazonian spandex than lycra, more washable, evaporates when you sweat. AT&T destroys the last real phone booth on West End Ave. The beginning of a new century, fortuitous, premonitory, still trying to make friends. There we were. Grace loved all the different houses. Imagine them as names for her identity. She was incorrect. She couldn't take them along in or outside her skin, then fading, the pores becoming too large, drilling holes into her various parts, by now conventional. It was the beginning of a new century. Juna, you still alive in there? Do I look like someone with a driver's license? I wanted to touch her. I was sure she could have been the driver and would have let her drive me anywhere. I'd parallel park for her wherever, whenever she got nervous. Instead, I forgot she was there and continued window shopping, inevitably leading me to impulse spending. You could argue I don't need another bottle of perfume. Perhaps Juna watched. She was known to time travel and was expert at being several places at once. Here, the speakers of the language have the hardest time. What to call it, in, on, at, or near. I know I'm fantasizing, and it's not nice to metamorphose an esteemed and ancient woman of modernist letters into a voyeur solely for the sake of my sexual pleasure. Yet how would she know, unless it was true, this is what happened? I could see both the horse-drawn buggies and the helicopters shipping water from anywhere, desalinated as a contrived plea. Forgive us, please, for dumping all that toxic waste. The shit still smells. Every Jew will tell you that, tell you that in great detail, and I can say this because I am one. The reason to hide here, you'd question me either way. Even if she didn't have an issue with Jews, I don't think she'd go for me in any of my stages. She might say my difference was attractive, most certainly in the wee hours. They say it if the hand fits. Well, it fit, and that mattered. It wasn't the chaos we minded. It was that his beauty got us. We no longer needed to argue about the forms. They made attractive envelopes, returned to senders, instructions included. For Castells, the most important contribution of the gay community to the city, in fact, is, quote, urban meaningfulness. That is, how decisively street life, popular celebrations, and joyful feasts have increased during the 1970s as a direct consequence of the gay presence. Much of the essential work, <clears throat> sorry, much of the essential queer labor being done, I want to suggest, is the performative endeavor of what Chicago School urban sociologist Ernest Burgess called the urban metabolism. In his classic and much critique work, he asks, in what way are individuals incorporated into the life of the city? By what process does a person become an organic part of his society? Though for Burgess, the city was an organism that when functioning properly, sort of simply digested newcomers. And he didn't really offer an awful lot of clues as to how specifically this labor was accomplished. Feminists have entered the breach. As planning historian Daphne Spain notes, male professionals built grand boulevards and civic monuments in search of the city beautiful. Female volunteers built the places of everyday life, the neighborhood institutions without which a city is not a city. Municipal housekeeping is Spain's term for the ways in which the links between private lives, public space, and formal politics were made clear by turn of the century women activists and volunteers. <clears throat> so this is from the Women's City Club of Chicago, an image from Daphne Spain's book. You can see how the morphology of Chicago is here mapped out on a series of connections <laughs> between City Hall and homes through the Milk Inspection Department, the Health Department, the Bureau of Contagious Disease, the Marriage License Bureau and so on. The building of an affectional community must be as much a part of our political movement as our campaigns for civil rights. Thinking about forms of queer organizing, not just under the rubric of politics, much less service provision, but as labor, unpaid labor, I would argue raises the stakes as we can think about the relationship between care and placemaking and the mystification and devalorization of gendered forms of quote, ongoing collective labor. Queering social reproduction, I argue, then becomes a question not just of making visible, but of rearticulating the value of feminist, uh, feminine, feminized caring labor in public space. And sometimes that means women's labor as performed by men. <laughs>